I want to talk with you tonight about the underlying neuropsychology of calm. Calm is a very as a positive state of being, not numbness, not apathy, not spacing out, a genuine calm around which absolutely other experiences can be flying. Uh, we've probably all had the sense of being in situations that are very intense and we're dealing with a lot and there's, you know, our heart is pounding, but in the core of our being, there's kind of a resolute, centered, clear-eyed, centeredness um, and a calm in the core of our being. Very, very useful, especially the less calm the world is or the more agitated your own body is, the more important it is to be able to find refuge whenever you want in a calm in your innermost being. So I want to talk about how to do that grounded in how the hardware works. <laughs> You know, this rickety contraption that's the product of three and a half billion or so years of evolution, 650 million years of the evolution of multi-celled creatures ending up with us. Wow. <laughs> what a mess. No, <laughs> it's actually in pretty good shape. So how can we operate the hardware? To put it in perspective, um, I'd like to offer some questions quotations initially from the Buddha that I also put in the chat toward the very beginning. If you want to go up and you can even copy them from the chat window and paste them into a document of your own if you want to hold on to them. Um, I'll read four quotations to you and then get into the physicality of this and then how to use it in really practical ways. Then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. So uh, from Udana, uh, this one, these are one of the book collections of the early uh, original teachings of the Buddha, as best we gather. Whose mind is like rock, steady, unmoved, dispassionate for things that spark passion, unangered by things that spark anger? When one's mind is developed like this, from where can there come suffering and stress? A mind like rock, steady. Here's another quotation. The wise are controlled in bodily action, controlled in speech, and controlled in thought. They are truly well controlled. There's a tremendous emphasis in the early teachings of the Buddha on sila, virtue, restraint, self-regulation, morality, different ways of talking about a cluster of things. And initially, I kind of resisted all that because I grew up with fairly critical, well-intended, but fault-finding parents. And, you know, some of those teachings just seemed like a bunch of finger-wagging, like be a good boy or person. Mm. But I've really come to appreciate how absolutely fundamental sila, that's the Pali word for this cluster, is in terms of self-regulation. It's so useful in terms of pragmatically promoting our own welfare, our own well-being and effectiveness, certainly in the world, and through regulating ourselves. The word I used there was control. That might sound a little too uptight. It really means regulation. Um, to use the Zen metaphor, like riding a horse with neither too tight nor too loose a rein skillful self-regulation, uh, which has also been long studied in psychology, uh, with skillful self-regulation, in addition to advancing our own interests in all kinds of good ways, it's enlightened self-interest in that it's a way to be moral and ethical and kind and, and respectful and helpful with other people. So there's a real centrality in self-regulation and the cultivation over time not of a rigid, top-down, metallic, armored stiffness, but a more supple, nuanced, fluid, flexible kind of self-regulation that's adapted to whatever the present moment is. I mean, if your house, I'll use a different example that's not so timely here. <laughs> you know, if a saber-toothed tiger were to burst out of the bushes, effective self-regulation would be to run quickly away. So self-regulation must, of course, be adapted to the particular situation. If uh, you're watching a 
sporting event and you're really excited about your team doing well, self-regulation might include jumping up and down and cheering on your team. So self-regulation is, is always adaptive, but still at the heart of it, there's a regulation. There's a, which uh, one major form of which can be calm. A third quotation, if one going down into a river, swollen and swiftly flowing, is carried away by the current, how can one help others across? In other words, as I just said, if we're agitated ourselves, if we're drowning ourselves in our own reactions, if we're flooded and overwhelmed by what's coming at us, which is understandable for a time, but if we continue to perpetuate that sense of being flooded and overwhelmed, if we never find our footing in the flood in some way, we can't help other people and we, we can't help ourselves. So I think it's really important to appreciate that it's okay, you know, as they say in the airlines, right, you know, put your own oxygen mask on first to kind of get some first aid going, stabilize yourself, and then move out there into the world. And then last, uh, related to uh, a major challenge to calm, the very understandable times in which we're appropriately angry at injustice, mistreatment, offense, um, hypocrisy that harms us and others we care about. Anger is a natural emotion. I've talked a lot about anger recently, um, including appreciating the value and the clarity and the energy that anger can bring. That said, Anger tends to have the most negative impact on others of all the expressed emotions, including the forms of anger that are contempt, disdain, dismissal, prejudice, and discrimination. And so anger is very important to be careful about. The Buddha spent a lot of time focusing on ill will. And I think it's useful to appreciate, as the Dalai Lama points out, the distinction between anger and hatred. It's important to be careful, though, because sometimes, for example, the longing for justice, understandably, still, that understandable longing for justice can become a craving for vengeance. And then anger has invaded our mind and poisoned our heart. As the Buddha also taught, knowing that the other person is angry, one who remains mindful and calm acts for one's own best interest and for the other's interest as well. Doesn't mean to suppress. They're these really, they're kind of funny in a way, uh, arg arguments between the Buddha and people who would come to challenge him and they would come to challenge him in various ways. There were the sort of the haughty, I'm better than you are, buddy, Brahmins of his time. Then there was these periodically, these eccentric, you know, yogis who had all kinds of strange practices of like, they thought that barking like a dog was going to make them enlightened or eating only leaves was going to make them enlightened. And the Buddha was really clear. <laughs> he didn't put up with crud, you know. He would say stuff like, uh, you know, as this come down to us, oh, foolish man. I mean, he could have said, oh, foolish woman but or person, but oh, foolish man. I mean, he, he brought it there. But there was a calm and a mindfulness and judiciousness in, in, in what he had to say so that when he said it, and I'm thinking here of people in, in history and social reformers like Martin Luther King uh, or others uh, who, when they, when they brought the heat, um, it had a lot of weight because it came with a fundamental uh, inner peace on the part of the person who spoke it. So in that context then of what I've said in terms of the Buddhist teachings and the value of calm, how can we do it? So I'm gonna quickly run through some major neurobiological, psychological machinery. And uh, you're, by the way, exactly right. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, may her memory be a blessing. Uh, if you watch uh, documentaries with her, the Supreme Court Justice in America, who recently passed away, um, and um, what's the word? The something RBG, the, the notorious, there we are, the notorious RBG. Um, Really remarkable, and she just you get to see it in the weight of what she brings. Kaboom! Um, you know, there's a real kaboom there. So, 
bowing to her as well. Okay, so how do we do it? Brief primer, neurobiology, maybe familiar to most people. Uh, in our body, we have these two major neurohormonal systems. Uh, the neurological aspects relate to what's called the autonomic nervous system. It says autonomic because it's kind of automatic, and yet actually it's uh, subject to a, a lot of self-regulation through mental practices, we can regulate this underlying uh, biological system that essentially has two aspects to it, two major aspects to it um, that are connected a little bit like a seesaw so that as one goes up, it pushes the other one down. The original uh, branch of the autonomic nervous system is the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system that has to do with conserving resources, recovering from bursts, or, and also repairing and regulating the absolutely central core viscera of the body, such as breathing and the internal organs. That's the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system, sometimes called the rest and digest branch of the autonomic nervous system. On the other hand, there is the more recently evolved sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system that uh, is particularly present in mammals and then who began to emerge around 200 million years ago. Uh, analogs to the sympathetic branch of the nervous system may be available or found in birds. I gotta look into that more, but they're not very available in reptiles, even complicated ones like a crocodile, because one of the things that the sympathetic branch of the nervous system gives mammals is the capacity for sustained pursuit. A lizard is really quick, but if you try to get a lizard to run for more than 50 feet across your backyard, it's going to get exhausted. But a squirrel, let's say, can jump and leap and run and keep on going. Sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is associated with fighting and fleeing, bursts of activity. Okay, so we have these two branches. They're not good or bad. One's not better than the other. They're very useful. The question is, to what function are they serve? Are they serving? So life presents challenges to us that continually rock our boat. The autonomic nervous system is the primary system in our body that's designed to keep us on an even keel as it very rapidly recognizes what's happening uh, in the nervous system, signals fan out, uh, related to parasympathetic or sympathetic activation that involved hormonal systems and then other systems, the heart, cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal in the body. But it's a central origin point, the autonomic nervous system, that attempts to keep us on an even keel as we maintain progress toward our important goals, primarily in terms of core needs for safety, satisfaction, and connection broadly defined, all right? When our needs are challenged, we can respond to them in a um, sustainable and healthy way inside what I call the green zone. So if there is a threat to safety, we can mobilize a sense of determination, calm, capable coping, and deal with the threat or deal with the pain without being overwhelmed by it. We're staying in the green zone as we manage that threat. Similarly, we can stay in the green zone, as it were, if we manage threats to satisfaction, let's say, by making good plans, holding on to a core sense of contentment and gratitude already, even as we face challenges to satisfaction and the attainment of our goals. Same with connection. We can manage challenges to connection while holding on to a sense of self-worth, holding on to a sense of the beingness of others, not turning them into its, retaining that sense of thou, even as sometimes we are fiery with them and we manage conflicts with them as adversaries of, of some kind. On the other hand, we can also manage challenges from the red zone. And you see a lot of that these days. You see a lot of that in history, and I certainly at least can recognize a fair amount of that in my personal history as well. That's when we encounter threats to safety and we get 
overwhelmed with fear and, and frozenness maybe or complete withdrawal or dissociation. We just space out or we feel completely helpless or immobilized or we get so angry we go on the attack in, in ways that are really problematic. Those would be red zone ways of managing challenges to safety. And you can see a similar kind of thing in terms of managing challenges to satisfaction and connection. Satisfaction, getting caught up in addiction of one kind or another, uh, getting caught up in drivenness toward goals, um, you know, being overwhelmed with depressed mood if there's a loss. These are, this is the red zone. Uh, this is your brain on craving of one kind or another and the suffering that follows. Same with uh, connection, challenges to connection, getting caught up in feelings of shame and inadequacy and low self-worth, or getting caught up in envy, resentment, or dehumanization of them, um, violence, cruelty, and war, red zone. Okay. So the issue is not whether we're tilting parasympathetic or sympathetic. The issue is green zone or red zone. And over time, as we build up resources inside ourselves for coping, we can manage growing challenges while staying in the green zone. And also over time, as we repeatedly internalize the felt sense of needs met enough already, then we build up an increasingly unconditional core of resilient well-being inside so that we feel in the core of our being already peaceful, contented, and loving as we manage, as chal as we manage challenges to safety, satisfaction, and connection. All right. So think about your own path here, red zone or green zone. It's understandable to go into the red zone for a little while, but to stay there, to be driven away from our kind of ground of being, our home, our home base, which is really the green zone because that's what's sustainable. That's Mother Nature's biological home base because it conserves resources, protects us, and um, enables us to sustain well-being. The green zone is our home base. But if you're spending a lot of time in inner homelessness, um, you know, that's not good. A person can have compassion for injustice. A person can feel sorrow while feeling fundamentally caring. That's the sweet alongside the bitter of the empathy for the pain of others, the suffering of others. So, um, okay. So my point about all this is that um, if we're immobilized and frozen, that's excessive parasympathetic activation. That's a red zone response to a challenge of safety, freezing. We don't want to freeze. That's not true calm. Similarly, if we move into states of high arousal, sympathetic activation, accompanied by negative emotion of overwhelming fear or anger or addictive grasping for whatever we want, that's the red zone. So the crux, red zone or green zone, is not parasympathetic or sympathetic activation. It's the presence or absence of positive emotion. Parasympathetic activation with positive emotions of peacefulness and ease and well-being, that's tranquility. That's calm. Sympathetic activation with positive emotions of delight, curiosity, interest, exuberance, enthusiasm, that's green zone. That's, that's healthy passion. That's healthy enthusiasm. So the crux is how to stay calm with positive emotion accompanied with a sense of agency to undermine the tendency to feel weak and helpless when we're calmer. That's a really key point. To maintain that sense of agency and clarity of intent, and even if there's quiet and relative inactivity, you don't feel overwhelmed. You don't feel um, overpowered in this kind of healthy calm. So I want to talk about how to build up this core of calm. Maybe later on we could talk about really interesting stuff about healthy passion and aspiration without attachment. But I want to focus now on some underlying ways to ground it in neuroscience and our understanding of the body that we can turn to, to build up a growing sense of calm inside ourselves.
We can have states of calm and traits of calm, right? We move from states to traits. So through having authentic experiences of various aspects of calm or the methods I'm going to talk about in a moment, and we internalize that, we can build up traits of calm hardwired literally into our nervous system and in uh, hardwired as well in lasting bodily changes in other systems such as the musculoskeletal system and the hormonal system. So I'm going to offer four key suggestions here for how you can build up a, grow a growing sense of calm inside yourself. The first of these is to develop greater resting state relaxation. So, for example, if you um, measure heart rate variability as a measure of resting state relaxation, what kind of heart rate variability do you have? Is it high, which actually is a measure of resting state relaxation? What's your heart rate? Uh, just kind of under normal conditions, especially when you're dealing with stuff. Is it relatively low? If you were to do one of those things that's testing your galvanic skin response like a lie detector, or if you were going to get a cortisol panel, what's your resting state? And there's a good deal of research that shows that as people develop um, greater resting state relaxation and they train in relaxation, they get improved expression of neurons inside their brain that calm down the stress response, thereby making them more resilient. If I were to offer a suggestion, it's to really ask yourself, especially if you're feeling tense as a resting state. If your resting state feels tense, beleaguered, rattled, <sighs> overly revved up as a way of life, not just a momentary or a fairly brief spike and then you return to baseline, well, Think about taking a minute every day, one minute. Just use your clock, use your timer, use your phone, and focus on really calming the body. There are different ways into relaxation. One of my favorites is long exhalations. As we exhale at length, the heart rate naturally slows down. The body naturally becomes calmer. Imagine taking three breaths in which the exhalation is twice as long as the inhalation. You can count them. For example, right now, you want to try it? Inhaling two, three. Exhaling two, three, four, five, six. Just that can have a real effect. Uh, imagine fluffy white clouds. Imagine progressively every part of your body relaxing. You can imagine trigger points around your jaw muscles, say, or your tongue, or the pelvic floor, or your diaphragm. The diaphragm's really good. Uh, there's some kind of magic there that if you're tending toward anxiety, uh, breathing into the diaphragm and relaxing the diaphragm can really reduce anxiety markedly. Not exactly sure why, but it seems to work. Uh, <clears throat> you know, relaxing your eyes and the space between your eyes, just for a minute or more a day, building up trait relaxation so that your baseline, it's like a thermostat setting. What's the temperature setting for you? Are you in the 80s? <laughs> Or, you know, are you cooler? Nice 68, you know? And then there's the oscillation around that resting state, you know, or sometimes you might get really super chill down to 65, and sometimes you might get a little irritated, agitated, tense up to 75. But, you know, then there's a question of, in addition to what's your resting state, what's your basic thermostatic setting, how rapidly can you recover to your resting state as a key marker of resilience? So that's what you can build up. When you build up resting state relaxation, you adjust your thermostat setting toward a more toward a cal toward a calmer in a calmer direction, and you can recover faster to it. Okay. Second suggestion: This is grounded in tons of research on memory and learning. Know where you are, and know what is okay about it. 
One of the fundamental developments in the brain as our rodent-like ancestors from 200 million years ago developed was the capability of, of place memory, often related to what they were smelling. Because the part of the brain that establishes place memory, the hippocampus, is really close to the olfactory bulb, the sniffer. <laughs> Where's the cheese? <laughs> Where are the velociraptors? Where's my baby? Where's my mommy? <laughs> you know, we need to know where we are. So therefore, really focusing on and highlighting a knowing where you are, orienting yourself, especially if there's a trauma history, as great teachers of trauma and practitioners like uh, Leslie Booker and others that I've learned a lot from, uh, talk about it, know where you are. That's great. It's very calming to know where you are and know what is okay about it. What is okay in the place where you are? No matter what's happening outside where you are, what is okay about the place where you are? There might be things that are not okay about it. The faucet, faucet might be dripping. The other person might be really annoying. But what else is okay? What is okay about the place where you are? Including in your own being. Maybe there's a pain in your back where you are, okay. And what else is okay in your body? Know where you are and know what is okay about it. Just try it. It's immediately calming. And if you have any chronic sense of inner homelessness or feeling dispossessed or dislocated, or you can't find your footing or you feel shaken, understandably, including sometimes because the world is shaken around you. Maybe you've lost a loved one or you fear the loss of someone or you're incredibly rattled by the state of your country and even the state of your world. <sighs> the more shaky it is, the more important it is to have a very felt sense that might start conceptually but becomes very embodied and felt of knowing where you stand, knowing where you are, knowing what your position is about something, what you're going to do with a situation at work or how someone is at home or managing this time of COVID or who you're going to vote for, you know, knowing where you stand, knowing where you are, and knowing what's okay about it. What is actually basically all right right now in the present? That is immensely calming. And that felt sense of calm in knowing your place is rooted in ancient, ancient, 200 million years old neurological systems, or they technically they began to originate around 200 million or so years ago, parts of the brain. It's very primal in us. And therefore, it has a very primal impact to know your place and know it's okay about it. Okay? Third, healthy relatedness. And I'm going to suggest here something really simple. Um, when we're upset, look for your go-to of relatedness, your relatedness go-to. Like a child who's upset, who has the teddy bear? Uh, when our when our daughter was upset as a youngster, um, she really, really wanted to be in her room. That was comforting for her. That, for her, she was very related to what was in it. Um, as a very creative person, her, who had a very rich relationship with the dolls and the bears and what was in her room. That was her safe space that she was related to. So what's a go-to for you? Maybe it's another person. Maybe it's a picture. There, we have pictures of friends on our refrigerator. A lot of people have that. Um, they're go-tos. I look at them, I feel better. Um, teachers, I look at Thich Nhat Hanh. You know, uh, I think about Ruth Bader Ginsburg right now, and I feel calmer, and I feel like fight the good fight, hang in there. You know, so who? What are your Go to, you know, your calm go-tos and know what that is. 
Uh, we evolved in very scary situations as hunter-gatherers over millions and millions of years, including the last several hundred thousand years as, on, as anatomically modern humans living in the Serengeti Plains and then spreading throughout um, the world. Um, and a lot of dangers. So having a sense of being part of a group, part of the tribe, part of the band, or knowing who our go-tos were that we could come to and come back to, who would stick up for us, who would help us, incredibly important for calming anxiety. So who's your go-to? Whether it's in your imagination or in the immediacy uh, you know, of, of life. And then last, um, this is something that is implicit in the Buddha's teaching, but I don't think there's a Pali <laughs> equivalent for this word, moxie. Moxie. I think in terms of calm, there is no replacement for finding inside yourself that indestructible core that may honestly have an aspect to it that can feel a little feral. Not amoral, not mean, not vicious, but a kind of animal vitality, a kind of fundamental undefeatableness in the core of your being, determination, whatever that is for you, you know? I think of this, um, this quality of moxie, if, if you feel as, as like a core of strength, core of grit. Grit is what remains when everything else has been worn down. What in the core of your being can you find as a, as a sense of moxie? Pick your own word if you like. Determination, grit. Uh, the Buddha described people who are you know, serious in their practice, uh, honorable in their practice as ardent, heartfelt. I mean, and, but ardent, courageous too, ardent. That's an aspect I think of moxie. Resolute, that definitely is an aspect of moxie. Resolute. You know, you may need to take a break from time to time, but your resolution doesn't take a break. You know, you're getting off the battlefield for a while, maybe, you know, you're repairing yourself, you're healing up, you're, you're refueling, you're gathering allies maybe uh, inside the frame of whatever you are resolute about. Uh, and diligent, the Buddha added, diligent, moxie, sustained and mindful. So I'll finish there on moxie or feisty, uh, not to abandon oneself, trust in oneself. John Lewis, another reference point here. Okay, that's my talk on calm, uh, including my four suggestions. I see a number of um, questions that have come in on the chat. We have about 10 more minutes and I'll, I'll reply to questions in chat just for efficiency and, and <laughs> and briskness. Uh, and then after we uh, end at 7.30 or close to it, those who remain after a few minutes uh, um, can um, will be moved into Zoom breakout rooms by Tom Brown, my co-host here. Uh, so if you want to discuss the evening, um, stick around for the breakout rooms. So I want to talk about, um, let's see here. So questions, comments that have come in. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I see a question here that's private, so I won't say the name. Uh, basically, when we in California, where I am and where this other person is, and I know this person, I, I really wish you well, when uh, fires and smoke comes in, the smoke alarm yells, fire, 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 and maybe we can't reach it. How do we stay calm then? You can't, and it's okay if we can't, right? Maybe inside the innermost core of one's being, there is a calm witness, which I think there is actually, an innermost core of stillness and almost transpersonal and perhaps really transpersonal, depending on how you experience it, stability of witnessing, while the 99.999.8% of you is freaking out. Let's be real. There's certain things that happen. Of course you can't be calm. But the question is, how rapidly can you return to a, to a sense of calm coping so maybe you can't reach it and your heart's pounding, but you slow it down, you determine whether your house is about to burn, you finally get a step stool, you reach the smoke alarm, and you pull the battery out of the darn thing and then figure out what's going on. You know, you're at least calm enough to cope effectively. You're not panicking and, and overwhelming. 
and overwhelmed. So I think it's important to have a reasonable standard for oneself. How fast can you find a calm footedness, even if your heart's still pounding? It actually takes a dozen or two dozen minutes for cortisol to be metabolized in the body, especially if we're not moving very much. That's one reason why I think we um, can get stuck with cortisol as modern humans who are sedentary most of the time, while our hunter-gatherer ancestors until just 10,000 years ago were on, walking on average six to eight miles a day. So they were clearing cortisol metabolically. So mother nature got used to fairly high levels of cortisol because it was being cleared. But we don't tend to have that opportunity. So it's natural to still be rattled. So be, you know, be, be gentle with yourself, right? And then over time, we build up resting state calm and kind of layers and layers and layers of resilience so that the same trigger doesn't rattle us quite so much. Instead of pushing us to a nine, it only pushes us to a seven. And then after a while, maybe a five or a three. That's a realistic expectation, I think. Okay. Um, Apps like the Calm app, many apps are great. Uh, I've seen people use Inner Balance from HeartMath for heart rate variability. It's a biofeedback device to develop trait calm. That's pretty great. Uh, whatever works, you know, and the, the whole point is states and traits. These uh, apps like Calm or me guiding you through a meditation, that's going to evoke a state and experience. That's great. That's step one, in effect in terms of lasting cultivation. But there's also a step two of learning, of moving from experiencing to a learning, from state to trait. It's really important to do that. So these apps are fantastic, but just make sure over time that you're able to withdraw the scaffolding from the building of your own being, uh, that you've the building you've established with the help of the scaffolding of these external supports, whatever they may be, so that you can stand on your own even without them, over time. Uh, to quote Milarepa, and you've heard me quote this, I suspect, if you've been here before, is he described his own life of practice. In the beginning, nothing came. In the middle, nothing stayed. And in the end, nothing left. So there's this progressive process that you want to make sure you help yourself with if you're using other resources like apps of different kinds. Okay. Oh, this is great. Thank you, Mary Hills. You, you were just kind of taking notes on, on my fire hose of teaching here. That's great. Okay, good. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see. Oh, great. Anything? Let's see. Questions? Um, so Tomas is asking about basically what about injustice? And he's giving a very specific example related to the killing of Breonna Taylor. And... Um, I want to use that not so much about the particulars of that situation, which I don't know. I know the particulars of, of her death and the killing which and the system in which that kind of injustice is clearly terribly common. I don't know the particulars of the recent court ruling or grand jury finding. But that said, broadly, if we know horrible things are happening out here, or at least within our view, in our view, horrible things are happening, all right? How do we stay calm, right? Authentically calm in relationship to that, incredibly important. And this goes to what is actually deeper than calm, which in the, the Buddhist framework is equanimity. Calm is essentially, generally, not having agitated states. I've hedged a little bit and said we can have a core of calm around which a certain amount of uh, uh, anger, sorrow, fear are swirling, but there's a, we're mainly identified with calm. Equanimity has to do with our relationship with all experiences and resting in a sense of equanimity balance, undisturbedness, no matter what is passing through the mind. So it's, it's deeper than calm. And one way to understand this is that in the seven factors of awakening that include tranquility and equanimity, they're differentiated from each other. 
And you can just kind of feel it. Um, tranquility is a very somatic way of being. Emotions are very quiet. The mind is, you know, can be very quiet. Um, it's great. Equanimity, in a way, is even more far-reaching. And there's a lot of insight that's embedded in equanimity and a recognition of impermanence and the emptiness, the lack of identity or essence in all experiences and most aspects of the material universe. I can say more about that later. I won't say much right now. So that said, um, there are different things that people can find in relationship to the horribleness. One is to really, really open our heart to it. In a funny kind of way, as we open our heart really, really fully, we, we go all the way out into a kind of fundamental spaciousness. And the spaciousness itself is stable, relatively equanimous and tranquil. You can just play with that. Really explore what it would be like to really open wide in compassion for what you find appalling and unjust and see what, where that takes you. That's one suggestion. A second suggestion is to um, have a sense of the vastness of history and not to minimize at all the present moment because that's the moment in which we live, but to just have a sense of the um, common humanity of mistreatment, injustice, abuses of power, abuses of state power, abuses of police authority around the world and in our own country, wherever you may be. Um, and there's just something about just kind of a wider view, historical view, that can that can somehow help us. And actually, neurologically, when we take a wider view, including lifting our eyes to the horizon, that helps us find a greater calm. It's not to be used as a spiritual bypass. We're not trying to, you know, no longer, we're not trying to distract ourselves by what I'm saying. It's, it's a way to hold and actually sustain our compassion and our commitment to action through these methods, because they enable us to stay with it. Last suggestion is a sense of common cause with others. You know, there's something about um, others, particularly others that are helpful, not so much others that rev you up in helpless outrage, because I don't think that's really very beneficial for the body-mind over time. But others who share your view about the facts, others who share your values, others who are with you and taking the actions that you can, that sense of being joined with others, in, including others like John Lewis, who recently passed away, and his amazing writings, the last essay of his entire life, you can find it. I think it was published in the New York, Mag New York Times Magazine, maybe, or you can locate it. Profound piece of writing um, about, you know, the good fight, basically, good trouble. So a sense of connecting with others is another deep way to find a growing calm. All right. And I'll, I'll just say the last thing that might be a little controversial, I don't know. I want to be careful in how I say it. It's to realize that there's so much crap in the world we can do nothing about. That's a fact. It's always been a fact. Doesn't mean we shouldn't care about the crap. I um, hope I'm not offending. But we just can't do anything about it. And so we ask ourselves, if I'm agitated 24 hours a day about the crap I can do nothing about, this horrible thing, that horrible thing, I'm not making anything better, and I'm making my life worse. And sure, I have a duty to the world, but if I'm not able to benefit the world, while meanwhile I'm harming myself, that's not a good equation. So to me, there's a place 
for, um, in effect, limiting their preoccupations with what's awful in the world and allowing yourself to find the happiness you can, as the Buddha put it, the happiness that is visible in this present life. Finding the happiness that you can in a plate of spaghetti. <laughs> Finding the happiness that you can in simply moving your own body, locating beauty around you, or, or turning to wisdom teachings, or watching A Place to Call Home, which is my wife's and I, my current fixation as we're binge watching our way now into the sixth season. You know, it's okay. It really is okay, I think to find what is all right in the local, even as you're aware of what is so not all right in the global. Okay. So let's sit here for a minute. And maybe if you can bring a calm into this last topic, which can be very understandably stirring, sitting together with each other for one last minute as we finish in a minute, You might have a sense of a wisdom, a kind of wise peacefulness spreading through your mind, which of course includes your body sensations. Like a gentle warm breeze with a lovingness in it. Gently blowing free the dust in your mind. Clearing out the cobwebs. Being this space, the awareness in which experiences occur. Thank you very much. And I really deeply appreciate your presence here. I scroll through the screens and see different faces and different people. And I really have a, a sense of you practicing with me and you practicing with each other for the sake of everyone. See you next week. <laughs>